أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ففهمنا سليمان وكلنا تينا حكما وعلما رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقضة من لساني يفقه قولي لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي الأذيم سبحانك لما وحنا عليك ألم لا تنسني ولا تنسني الحمد لله أفضل الحمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله وسائر النبي والصالحين وسلم أن موفقني وحديني وسددني وجمالي بين السواب والثواء وعذني من الخطي والهرمان آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of questions and answers I'm your host I'm Jid Muhammad and I'll be with you for what remains of this hour next 40 minutes or so dealing with your questions your queries and your curiosities if you want to call in, then please ring on 01274214299. That's 01274214299. And we will endeavor, inshallah, to answer your questions when you call into our studio. Adil is at hand to take your calls. He sat patiently and as he waits for the phone to ring in order to patch you through to our studio here in Bradford. Uh, for me to deal with those queries. If, on the other hand, you're feeling a little bit shy on a Friday, then the email is amjad, A-M-J-A-D dot Muhammad, M-O-H-A-M-M-E-D at al-khair, A-L-K-H-A-I-R dot org, as you can see on the screens right now. And that's the email which will literally ping on my phone right next to me, okay, uh, as he puts it on mute. Uh, just to make sure that you do not get disturbed by any uh, messages coming through. Let me check if we've got anything coming through at the moment. Uh, we have nothing at the moment that have come through. So, inshallah, I'm here waiting for you to email uh, or take your calls. In the meantime, uh, we will see what questions we have already uh, on the groups. As you know, what happens is I have questions which come regularly. Uh, on the WhatsApp, uh, sorry, on the Telegram channel that we have, which is the Markaz al wal Qada. We have a group for sisters and we have a group for gents. Um, and those are available uh, for you to um, put your questions to us so that we may answer them. And uh, some people, obviously, throughout the week, they pose their questions on there and I will check on there whilst we wait for the phone string. I will also mention to my colleague who is listening attentively that he digs deep into the other bag of emails so that if I do run out of questions on here and we're still waiting for the phone to ring, at least we have some queries on that particular point also answered. So plenty of options as we wait for you to call. Uh, we were spending today getting all the chairs out, setting up the screens, setting up the speakers as we prepare for our session on Sunday, the 8th of uh, January, in which we will be delivering a seminar on mental health and well-being. Uh, that will be taking place here at the Iqra Studios at Al Khair Foundation Bradford. And inshallah, you are invited to attend. Uh, there are limited spaces. We've had a huge response uh, in excess of 200 uh, people have registered uh, for the event and you know it's taken us by surprise uh, the person who normally delivers this brother Kothar is absolutely shocked he says normally I get around 140 130 uh, but he's uh, we've got way over uh, what was expected so we are optimistic uh, inshallah of a good turnout and uh, we can then obviously ensure that people are satisfied as they leave uh, whilst we wait for those that phone to ring, let's take one of these questions here. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Mufti Sab, I have heard many ulama state that the wearing of niqab for women is actually wajib and not nafal. Is there any dalil for this? Also, how many, how may a person advise his mother, sister, wife, etc. to adorn the niqab in such a case where they may not accept its importance since they become habituated to just wearing the hijab for a number of years rather than the hijab and niqab? Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You are correct, uh, my dear brother, uh, for you know what the ulama have mentioned to you. May Allah bless you for seeking your ilm from reputable ulama. 
sitting in their durus, uh, sitting in their uh, bayan, sitting in their lectures and learning the deen to benefit yourself and by extension to benefit your family, especially those who are under your responsibility. And yes, it is quite right that the niqab is wajib. The reason being is, as you draw that distinction there, we have unfortunately drawn a distinction as to what we consider to be hijab. What we have done is we have made the head covering and we call that the hijab. And therefore, when a sister wears a head covering, we say, oh, look, she is practicing hijab. And when she does not wear a head covering, we say she is not practicing hijab. But hijab is actually a concept. The words hajaba, hijab, means to conceal, uh, to, to, to cover, uh, to, to not make apparent, and, and words to that effect. So the concept of hijab is based upon the um, separating, the non-mixing uh, of the two sexes. That's really what it's about. That is hijab. Now, the issue is that upon the male, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put the faraid of providing for his family and providing for himself. Now, apart from if he works from home, which back in the day obviously didn't exist because either people were tradesmen or they, had, uh, they either sold, they were merchants or they were tradesmen in the sense that they had a trade. Okay, either that or they were farmers. So either being a farmer, which means getting outside of your house, uh, being a tradesman, usually meant getting outside of your house, and being a merchant meant getting outside of your house. So men had no choice but to get outside of the house, and also they played public roles. So they had the responsibility for ensuring uh, the application of the law. Uh, they had responsibility for governance, uh, and everything else that comes with it. And therefore, once that, gen once that sex, the male, was outside of the house, then we found, obviously, the roles and the responsibilities that were given to the other sex, the female, was one of uh, being once married, having children, and rearing children, which is usually done inside the house. So naturally, biologically, because of the roles that the two played, meant that uh, the male was outside of the house and the female was inside of the house. And that was, by definition, the concept of hijab. But obviously, women have a need to leave the house. There's no doubt about that. They need to go to whatever they need to do, those responsibilities that they have in order to leave the house. So therefore, how can she now practice hijab when she's outside of the house? And this is where the concept of hijab came, which is described in great detail in the Qur'an, which speaks about drawing uh, the khimar over the person's head and across the uh, chest and shoulders. And what would happen naturally is it would also cover the face. However, we have narrations which obviously mention that the aura of a woman is everything but her face and her hands. So from this understanding, we say that the aura of a woman is everything bar her hands and her face, like the aura of a man is between his navel and his knee. These are those parts of the body which can only be shown uh, to one's um, mahram. Yani beyond that, obviously, between the navel and knees, only to his wife. He cannot even show that to his mahram. But for a woman, if she rolls her sleeves up uh, in front of her father or she rolls her trouser legs up, or she does not wear a, uh, a scarf over her head or whatever, then there's no harm upon her. But also she has her uh, khususi uh, aura, the uh, part which she can only show to her husband. And so we have that understanding. So this was originally one piece of garment we know from other narrations in which Aisha Radhi Anha clearly demonstrates and explains that they would drop the uh, cloak over their faces when men would go past them, when they were in the state of ihram, and when they would leave, they would raise them again. I know the narrations of this nature. So, they, so basically, if we go down to what the garment was, then it was basically a shawl, a sheet, 
uh, which was brought over the head and one part was thrown over one shoulder and one part was thrown over the other shoulder. As you can see, that is used also to cover the face because you can draw it across your face. And also it means that the way it drops from the shoulders means that you cannot discern the uh, nature of a woman in terms of her body. As time has gone on, that garment then, this shawl, this sheet, changed into three pieces of garment. One got referred to as the burqa, one was referred to as the hijab, as I say, and one which was the niqab. In reality, the hijab is a concept. It is not a piece of clothing. Clothing is used to achieve hijab, but not just one piece of clothing. And therefore, once this, is worn, once this became separate into three separate garments, then people started to say, ah, well, there's no need to wear the niqab because that is not uh, aura. So the niqab was removed. And once the niqab was removed, then it was said, well, there's no need for a burqa as long as you are covering your body. So the burqa was removed. So that you will have sisters who will wear tight fitted clothing, but they will then have a headscarf on their face and they will say, I practice hijab. And this is what's only left. So really, you ask the question at the end, how may a person advise his mother, sister, wife, etc. to adorn the niqab? Well, my brother, with practice is always based on education. So this is always about education. Unfortunately, uh, it is a slight uphill struggle. Why? Because of the fact that people who have not been practicing it for such a long time may find it difficult now to practice it. But Allah is the one who gives tawfiq. And at the end of the day, وَمَا alayna إِلَّا الْبَلَاغِ Your job is to get the message across, provide the environment. Education is key in order to make a person's path easy. The rest, obviously, you make dua to Allah and you pray for the best. So that uh, detailed answer covers that particular bit. And uh, that, uh, mashallah, brings our questions on the gents group to an end. That was quite a long answer. The reason why it was a long answer because um, it's quite a important question because it is something how things are changing now in our communities and in our societies. And it's important people understand the, the basic uh, the, the, or the basis of it in order to be able to practice it. We have a few minutes left, my dear brothers and sisters, before we go for a short break. So please do get your question in now if you want it answering before we go for a break. If not, if the question is not posed in the next few minutes, then inshallah you will have to pause and come back to us uh, after the break. One question which has come up, uh, via an email and I will tackle that before I go back onto the groups uh, to answer those questions and that is um, okay that one is done where are we going here da, 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 da. what's that one done ah there we are so before we get on to those sorts of questions uh, we're going to answer that question, which has now disappeared. Uh, so, is it, uh, something about, um, is it okay to put food in the bin, I think? Something like that. What was it like that? Was it? There you go. Putting bread and food in rubbish bins. Yeah. Now, we shouldn't really be throwing food away. Okay. Food is something that we have in order to consume. So, how can we avoid? I know it happens. How can we avoid throwing food away? Well, what we should do is when food is served, it should be served from a main dish. And what each person should do is they should take from that main dish only that amount of food that they're going to eat. So let's just say it's rice. Okay. Then they should only take that if they're eating it alone individually. Then they should only take that amount of rice which they know they're going to finish. They should not take extra rice that they're not going to finish. Similarly, if you're bringing, and that works better, because when you bring a plate of food and you put it in front of everybody, then it's our natural habit to put more in. And when people are eating from it, and then there's some food left, we feel bad to return that back into the pot, because people's hands have been in it, somebody might have put some yogurt on it if it's rice. 
Somebody might have put some chutney on it and not everybody likes to mix that inside it. So the, the, the usually the mother will, will throw it away. So that's why it's best to have a main plate and from that main plate, that food is taken and then it is uh, distributed uh, accordingly and people take their share. If that is the case, then there will be no food left over to throw away. There will only be food that hasn't been eaten. So now that comes down to how much food should you cook? Well, a person will know, a cook will know, if there's three people in the house or four people in the house and they're preparing a dish for two days worth of cooking, normally you know, a chicken is prepared or some dal is prepared or whatever for a day or two days worth, then you will cook that amount which you know that it will finish so really, it's got to come better to food management. Because we're spoiled, because we have so much food, we always make more. So what if it gets thrown away? Is there going to be anything wrong if you don't eat all the way up to your fill? It's not going to be the end of the world. It's not going to be a problem. It's not going to be an issue. Okay? That you, you know, you have to, oh my goodness, I wanted to eat two and a half chapatis, but I've only eaten two and a quarter, or I'm going to die. No, you're not. But because we've now built that kind of mindset, uh, unfortunately, that's the way we have become. So that is the best way to manage it. And yes, we should not be throwing food away. We should not be throwing bread away, whatever. Sometimes what people do is they go outside and they put, leave food in their garden. Problem with that is you get rats. I know people think, oh, I'm feeding the pigeons or I'm feeding the seagulls or whatever it is I'm feeding. What happens is, obviously, if the pigeons don't come or they don't eat it, the food that gets left, you get rats. And rats carry diseases. So that's not a good thing either. So, you know, we should avoid that. So in essence, uh, only cook that amount of food that you're going to eat. Serve that amount of food that you're going to eat. So there will be no food spare there will be no food wasted. We waste so much food, it's incredible how much food we waste. And we're going to be questioned about it on the Day of Judgment. So that answers the question that has come to us via email. I've got a few more questions on our ladies group, but we've run out of time for our first session. So we're going to disappear for a few minutes. We will return, inshallah, in a few minutes' time. And then we will deal with those questions that have come via our Marko Zulifta Wal Kada sisters group. However, our phone lines will still be open for the last time this week, obviously. It is Friday. We will be away on the weekend and returning back with my colleague on Monday for more Q&A. So take benefit before the weekend break. So don't go too far. I'm going to have a few sips of this beautiful coffee and I will see you in a few minutes' time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.